Hello, everybody, and welcome to the last formal panel for today for Wakona. Um, and I want to introduce the guy who's convening the whole thing, and that is Dan Reed Miller. Dan, Hi. take it uh, away. Thank you, Christina. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Christina Dan Reed Miller. I am a Pittsburgh based writer, and I'll be uh, convening this session today. Um, for everyone tuned in, I just I uh, want to point out that we really encourage you to send us your questions in the comments section of wherever you're watching uh, this from. Right now we're streaming live on Facebook and YouTube, so put your questions in the comments and our panel will try to address some of those questions either um, toward the end or possibly during the session if it fits into the conversation at hand. Um, and speaking of our panel, allow me to introduce them to you. Uh, first up, Two of our panelists are at the Whitewell Bookstore, which is a general interest, family-owned, independent bookstore in Pittsburgh. Their uh, selection of new books include a broad range of contemporary and literary fiction and nonfiction, poetry, history, philosophy, um, local authors, independent presses, children book, books, um, and much more. So Whitewell aims to be a community hub, a place for engagement, conversation, and sharing ideas. Um, above all, they are is oh, we're back. Okay, um, and uh, you can follow White Whale Bookstore on social media at White Whale BKS everywhere, and subscribe to their newsletter on their website. Uh, whitewellbookstore.com. Uh, representing White Whale on the panel are first uh, Anna Claire Weber. Uh, Weber is the events manager at White Whale Bookstore and the translation editor for The Offing. She received her MFA in creative nonfiction writing at the University of Pittsburgh, my alma mater, in 2019. Um, you can say hi to her through White Whale's social media accounts, which she often helps manage, or through her own at Frights Flaggy. That's F R I T E S F L A G E Y for Twitter and Anna Claire Superstar on Instagram. And also from White Whale is one of its owners, Adley Yeomans. Uh, thank you so much for participating. We're really excited to uh, get your perspective and your insight. Um, so thank you for being here. Um, and we're also fortunate to be joined by Amy Jo Burns, the author of the memoir Cinderland. And Shire, a novel which is out right now from Riverhead Books. Her writing has appeared in the Paris Review Daily, Tin House, Plowshares, Good Housekeeping, Electric Literature, Literary Hub, and the anthology, Not That Bad. And keep in mind that is the name of the anthology and not my take on her list of publications, <laughs> which is in fact exceedingly impressive. Um, and next on the panel is Leah Bickerton from the Tiny Bookstore. Uh, the Tiny Bookstore is a Black-owned bookstore in Ross Township, PA. The 300-square-foot store has an eclectic mix of books, toys, and collectibles, and serves as a community resource in the North Hills. Uh, thanks for being here, Leah. We really appreciate it. And finally, the panel would not be complete without two of our very own, from Wakona Live, Christina Fistonic and Damian Dressick. Now... Wakona Live Reading Series is a weekly live stream that features the best and brightest voices of Northern Appalachia and beyond. Um, Co-host Dressick and Fasonic began the series in March 2020 as a response to the COVID-19 crisis, but the show is <clears throat> continued to remain a fixture on the regional, regional literary scene. Um, as for the two co-hosts, uh, Fasonic is an associate professor of English at Cal U of Pennsylvania, where she teaches expository writing uh, creative nonfiction and digital storytelling. She is the author of more than 30 books, including a memoir, The Optimistic Food Addict, Recovering from Binge Eating Disorder, MSI 2016, and a forthcoming co-authored book, <coughs> Digital Storytelling as Public History, a guidebook for educators, Rutledge 2020. Her articles and essays have appeared in academic journals, online magazines, and newspapers, including the Northern Appalachia Review, We Lunk, and in Wheeling Magazine. As I said, along with Jurassic, she co-hosts the Writers' Conference of Northern Appalachia's twice-weekly live series. 
and she lives in beautiful Wheeling, West Virginia. And rounding out our panel is Damien Dressick, the man, the myth, the legend. Born and raised in Pennsylvania's cold country, Dressick is the author of the novel 40 Patchtown and the experimental story collection Fables of the Deconstruction, which is forthcoming in 2021. His creative work has appeared in more than 50 literary journals and anthologies, including W.W. W. Norton's New Micro, Host Road, New Orleans Review, Cut Back, Fail Better, Hippocampus, Smoke Long Quarterly, Heartwood, and New World Writing. A Blue Mountain Residency Fellow, Dressick is the winner of the Harriet Arnau Award and the Jesse Stewart Prize, as I said several times, but I will continue to say and plug, along with Fasonic, he co-hosts Wakona Live, the virtual reading series that brings some of the very best in Appalachian writing to the world. And he teaches creative writing or excuse me, he teaches writing at Clarion University of Pennsylvania and can be found online at andressic.com. So thank you all for being here. I'm going to turn it over to our illustrious panel by posing this question. So for Northern Appalachia writers in particular, um, distance and geography and at times even unreliable internet access can isolate them more so than writers in other regions. Now, on top of that, right now, this pandemic has put a hold on public readings and other events that normally keep the literary community buzzing. So my question is, what are some strategies that Northern Appalachia writers in particular can use to grow their audience in this region at this particular time? And whoever wants to start can just go ahead and jump right in. I guess I, yeah, I'll, I, I can, I can go. <laughs> um, so, uh, I'm coming at it from a, from a bookstore perspective. Um, so, you know, uh, right after the pandemic started and the lockdown happened, um, we changed over to, uh, virtual events solely. And so the, um, the way we're continu continuing to do outreach is with virtual events. That's basically all all we can do at this point in terms of meeting up um, virtually. So we um, we basically have done a full pivot and do the same amount of books. Prior to the pandemic, we were doing about 20 books a month, and we continue to do a little bit, uh, a little under that, but basically the same number now. So it's, it's a lot, um, and we continue to try to uh, hosts, um, author book launches, you know, the, and of course, um, local author events is one of our, our biggest things that we do do. Um, so yeah, I'll let someone else take it from here. Lee, I think you were about to say something. I was, and I don't <laughs> want to duplicate what was already said, but, um, I think that I'm someone who always, tries to find an opportunity and anything that could be a drawback, you know, with us being such a tiny store, you know, 270 square feet, we round up as all small things tend to do sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, like one of the things that we learned with that experience is that sometimes you have to think differently in order to really deliver what we want to do. So I think that one of the, one of the good things is to lean into what the opportunity presents. You know, with us being a tiny bookstore, we couldn't do things in the same way that bigger bookstores did. So what we did was we leaned into that by creating a particular experience. So with the Rona, the question became, okay, how do we lean into this particular thing to create a similar experience? And it's just like, you know what? This is an opportunity to actually reach more people. Mm -hmm. To a certain extent, we had already been relying upon using live streams and that sort of thing. And we noticed that we had like a pretty good reach with that. So, you know, that's something that we really decided to just really put a lot of attention into, you know, instead of putting a lot of thought into, okay, this is what the display should look like in the store for this particular period of time. We just pivoted to looking at what the online opportunities were. Stay nimble like that. And I like that. That's a, that's, um, not just uh, how do you get around something, but how do you use it to your advantage? That's really cool. I like that. Um, Damien, were you about to say something too? Well, I was listening to Lee and all I could think about it was when, when this all started, in some ways, I, I, the kind of line that was running through my head was a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Ah. And, you know, I, I what's up? 
That was a really good point. Well, I mean, I think about Adlai and the White Whale Bookstore because I've gone to so many wonderful readings there. Uh, I've read there you know, a couple of times, and it's it's such an important uh, thing to have in Pittsburgh in terms of building literary community, a place where people can get together um, and read and hear readings. And also commerce takes place because let's not forget, with without people buying books, our, um, publishers – who are you know poor putting out this this regional literature can't continue to exist. There wouldn't be you know an Autumn House books. There wouldn't be a Bottom Dog if no one's able to buy the books. Um, so I reached out to Christina and, and we were thinking, well, what what could we do? And we just thought about the you know did a, this reading series. Um, now I used to run a reading series in person in um, the Highland, but the border of Highland Park and East Liberty uh, at the Union Project, and. I thought when we started this, well, maybe we'll get 25 people. Maybe we'll get 50 people. Christina, what's our what's our biggest uh, our biggest viewer uh, viewership? I think it's 2,200, right? I believe so we have 2,200, 1,300, yeah. 750, 550. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'd have to have the idea of that I could, you know, with two people, Christina and I, uh, we could we could in any way organize a reading that 1,500 people could attend. We'd have to be like the 92nd Street Y or something to do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. And I, I really think people are, um, because that's the thing of it is, you know, you might worry about doing an online series versus doing a public, like in person series. But remember, your audience is going through the same thing you're going through, right? So that's mm. where they're at. They're hungry for it. And, and I think that has helped get contribute to the success of it is that, you know, uh, Wakona was there to, um, to provide that for them. Very good point. Yeah. Um, so oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, no, was, I was just going to say that um, one of the many advantages that we've had since we started the series was meeting amazing writers that we might not have been able to meet in person prior to this. And one of those people is on this panel. Amy Jo came on and read to us from Shiner. And that book is phenomenal. And I, I want everybody listening to go read that book. You will love every minute of it. I read it twice back to back. Oh, thank you. I know, right? And I really loved it. Um, and I think that now more than ever, we have to help each other as writers and as bookstore owners and as editors of journals and as everybody in the writing community like this, we have to come together and keep coming together if we're going to sustain ourselves. You know, I mean, it's hard for us under normal circumstances and now it's even harder, but like Leah said, leaning into that and what can this misfortune bring us that we can use to do what we do best already um, is the only way to go, you know? Absolutely. I want to build. I want to say one thing about that, Christina, because I, in terms of what we can do in this circumstance that we couldn't do otherwise, like we were able to have Jacinda Townsend on, um, and she's a wonderful and amazing uh, writer. But we, without some sort of massive university support, we certainly could have could not have brought her to uh, to town. Um, and presented her, you know, gotten, you know, gotten her to read. This just would not have been the the, the, the um, logistic hurdles and, and costs would have been uh, really challenging. But you know, Jacinda is, uh, you know, she's a wonderful writer and was able to be generous with her time. And we were able to just boom. It's it's if she's in if she's in Memphis or uh, we had Tommy Dean come from Indiana. We have had people uh, James uh, James Charlesworth read from Boston. And these were just things that we, we could not have done otherwise. Absolutely. And I think that's um, particularly helpful for um, this region. Um, I actually was about to make the point and, and I see a comment that addresses it. Um, that's it right there. Uh, Kathy Lentes says, as a, as a person mm -hmm. who lives in rural Southeastern Ohio, I have been able to participate in far more readings, webinars, et cetera, since the pandemic started. Online opportunities have brought the world to me, and I couldn't agree more. I um, I live in Pittsburgh now, but for the longest, I lived about 45 minutes uh, southeast, um, and and I, all my friends would say, you know, you, are you coming to this, uh, this reading tonight? And I'd think, oh, well, do I want to drive, you know, almost an hour both ways 
Um, whereas now it's, it's right at our fingertips and everyone's catching up. I think that helps, um, particularly in this region where geography is such, can be such a barrier um, in, in this area. Yeah, definitely. Well, Amy Jo, how do you um, feel like as, as a writer, um, have you been helped by, hindered by, I mean, how has that happened? I know Damien just had a book come out during this pandemic, as have all of our friends and, you know, a lot of our friends. So how, how, has you, how have you been coping with all of this? You know, I, th I think one interesting thing, especially as somebody who's from Northern Appalachia, the book that I wrote and, and probably all of you, the book I wrote is, is about what it means to be isolated. And um, I never thought that my book would come of age in a time when the whole planet was experiencing that in such uh, an intense way. So I think what happened with me, you know, I sort of had thought, okay, when I launch this book, I'm going to try to have a lot of per in-person interactions. But what I was really wanting that I still was able to get was not in person, but was personal, right? So I had to kind of rethink some of the things that I'd wanted to do in person. Um, for example, I'd wanted to, a friend and I together made some hand pressed dandelion bookmarks. Um, I, had, I wanted to hand those out in person. I ended up putting them in the mail. I did the same with book plates. I'd wanted to bake a bunch of cookies for a launch event that were in the shape of a moonshine jar. I did it just for myself and my husband and I ate them all, but I took some great pictures, you know? Um, and I, I think the learning for me after I allowed myself a period of, of sadness of feeling like, what does it mean when you have spent four or five years of your life writing a book? And then you feel like it has gotten caught in this tide of a, a global pandemic. You know, what do you do? I, I allowed myself a season of feeling sad, but then as you've all been saying, I think there's every reason to be encouraged right now um, as a writer who's launching a book because, you know, like you said, we can attend so many different kinds of panels. There's a ton of uh, Facebook groups. So I think something I learned was that I don't necessarily need to have a wide reach as a writer. That's not necessarily my wheelhouse, but I can find ways to connect with people who do. And um, this whole thing has sort of taught me that when you write a book and you want to share it with the world, you need to find a way to tell the story of your story. And for a long time, I thought I shouldn't do that, you know, but I, I was thinking as a writer, not as a reader. Right. So I had to find a way to sort of tell the story of how my book came to be, but do it through items and pictures and videos and that kind of thing. So, and I'm still figuring it out to be honest, but um, I am a mother of two small kids. So I would not have been able to do nearly the number of events that I've been able to do, I mean, in my bedroom. Um, so I think that has been a real plus for me personally where I'm at. Absolutely. And, and Damien, what, um, can you speak to your experience in that regard with um, trying to launch during while all this is going on? Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 uh, I, Love the idea of the the cookies in in the shape of. I actually made a note for myself. I'm gonna, when I get to do live events, I'm gonna make get rock candy that's this black like coal, yeah. and I, I can kind of pass out of it. Um, some of the the events. No, it was it was not it was not dissimilar. Um, in, in some key ways where, uh, and some of it's some of it's very um like material concerns. Like oh, I, I know like James Charles Earth and I were talking and like oh you've got to you you know you work as Amy says you work really hard and, and get this book and you're oh I'm going to read at this university and I've lined up this university and I've lined up this university and this university and my publishers spent money to you know put out ads for the book and do all this stuff and you know oh this bookstore this bookstore this bookstore and you're kind of like, wow, what, none of these kinds of things can happen right now. And, and that was, that was actually kind of what steered me into a kind of live. Well, what can I do to, to, what can I do? Um, you know, and technology in some ways, I think empowers us in, in ways that had this happened in 1993, the world the, trying to do this wouldn't, it wouldn't be a realistic thing. Definitely. And now, um, so Leah and Adley, um, I was curious, uh, um, from the bookstore perspective, um, well, first let me ask, are, are you all, um, 
have you reopened uh, for in person or no, not not yet, or or what's your uh, status is uh, as of right now? Right now, we're still virtual shopping and curbside only because with that tight space, we can't actually have customers in the store and staff the store at the same time. So minor problem, fix with the curbside pickup. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> uh, and and, and uh, uh, so we've we've been open um, since Allegheny County went green. So we have um, a lot of different safety procedures in the store. Um, we do, you know, a lot of a lot more online orders than we used to do. A lot more pickup. We have a the capacity. We're about twelve hundred feet at the store, and we're capped at five customers at the most. So sometimes we have, you know, people waiting to turn outside. But um, yeah, we've been open for uh, a few months now. Oh, very good, very good. Um, and Christina, um, did I read that right? In your, um, I was trying to see in your bio. Um, you have one, uh, a book that's uh, forthcoming uh, this year. Um, is Did that get pushed or, or is it still set for right now? Well, the interesting thing was uh, Rutledge Press, who's publishing that book, approached me and my co-author and said, could you step on it, like make this happen faster? Because a number of people had to drop out of their contracts because of COVID-19, because of caring for relatives or children or their, they couldn't continue their research because it involved human subjects or, you know, and you don't have access to people physically anymore. So we were actually moved um, into production. It was moved up to December um, where we thought that it wouldn't be out until March. And so we're kind of nervous about it, but because our project deals with digital storytelling and public history, one thing we did to uh, make the book more viable for teachers and the students who use them and museums that use it and so forth is to add a, how do you do this completely online? And that's what we're doing now. We're actually piloting the online component of the book this semester. We're working with the Q Creek Mine Rescue Site outside of Somerset, Pennsylvania and some other sites, but we're doing it all virtually. Um, and so that when somebody does use our book, if they just decide to adopt it for their classes or their you know, professionals or workshops or whatever, um, they'll be able to have the advantage of us having already gone through it and work the bugs out to help them um, do it themselves if they want it, if they have to do it or want to do it virtually. So that's sort of how we've, we've adapted. Oh, okay. And, and yeah, the first one through, but that's also, you know, it has its challenges, but it also, I'm sure has its uh, uh, positive sides to it. Um, no, for sure. And digital storytelling is such a, um, it's, it's a, a form for now. And, you know, we can do it now with web-based editors and things like that. And, and do all, and the, the story of the book itself, and I won't go on much longer, but the story of the book itself is that, my, my uh, partner and I wrote this um, exclusively because we couldn't meet together physically over Zoom and in Google Docs. Mm. And so we were in Google Docs together and talking about what we were writing and writing together. And um, it was quite an experience. So if anything, it's like what Leah said, we said, okay, what can we do? We're in, in this moment, what can we do to take advantage of this? And one way was, to make our sessions, our work sessions, even more um, valuable and useful um, than they might have otherwise been. Nice. Yeah, absolutely. And I, um, I just wanted to hit on one question in the comments. Um, uh, the title of your new book, Christina. Do you want to? Oh, them... it's called um, "Digital Storytelling in Public History: A Guidebook for Educators and Museum Professionals." Fantastic. Um, yeah, and we're getting some some good uh, feedback in the in the comments. I wanted to ask yeah. um, because I see a, a couple people, um, and we touched on this at the start, um, and I don't know if there's even a good answer for this. But um, what is something that we can do um, to sort of make make writing accessible to people who are in areas with with bad internet? Uh, or, or low internet connection. Um, I'm seeing, you know, a lot of people have that problem. They're in a sort of a broadband desert, so to speak. Um, and I'm wondering if um, downloadable content might be a possible solution. But I don't know. I mean, as as writers and, and as people who 
who uh, run bookstores, uh, what do you all think? What are some possible solutions for that? If there are any good solutions, I'm not sure. Um, you know, being in Pittsburgh, that isn't something that I've thought about a lot, frankly. I think um, we, uh, we, so we store all of our events that we save and, you know, in the new year, we're going to start reposting the really good ones to kind of put them out there again. Um, but, um, you know, in terms of uh, rural areas that just don't have access to a period, I, I'm, I'm afraid I don't really have any good answers for that. I think that what I would probably look to do is to see if there's a way to promote that isn't necessarily dependent on streaming or broadband. So I'm just floating this out there. I know that there were people who were like tweeting out set like a book, like one tweet at a time, maybe doing something similar through text messages because SMS tends to be able to float through in areas where internet connections aren't necessarily as good. So maybe putting out like teasers from a book or like a series of books, something like that I think would be interesting. Oh, that would be very cool. That's almost reminiscent of, and, and it was touched on, uh, Damien, you mentioned, um, in the in the 90s if this would have happened what would we have done and and that idea leah actually i love that because that's almost reminiscent of the 90s back when um you know those those chain letters used to go around and if if you know that's something where if you send an sms te text message and try to get that to start spreading around a little bit that could be a whole new um avenue i think um especially in rural areas because you know Despite the distance ge geographically, um, a lot of people uh, tend to know each other in the region and things like that. So that could be a very cool um, a possibility. Um, you know, um, a suggestion that I would have that has worked for me um, that is honestly hit or miss based on the news cycle. But something I like to recommend to writers who have a book coming out is to get three essays ready. One is targeted toward a literary type audience, like say the Paris Review or Guernica, something like that. One is more mainstream for say, you know, Aim High, New York Times, Washington Post, L, that kind of thing. And then the third is, is aiming one toward writers and for, you know, say like a literary hub audience, because again, what that does, and basically you could write something about your book that fits each one of those audiences and start you know, start six months before your book comes out, start pitching it, figure out where to go. Because what, like I said before, finding those networks that have a wide reach, then you don't have, it's not so on your shoulders, you know what I mean? To sort of find the people who have the megaphones. And that's an easy way to do it where you can just, you know, as soon as you find an internet signal, email it out. And um, that's something that could, could help. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's as much... Um, and, you know, we had that editor's panel earlier, which was great, but um, even just stepping back more big picture than that, um, it's all about, and, and I'm sure the editors will be the first to tell you, it's all about um, uh, honing that message um, so that it's, it's specific for the audience you're trying to reach. And then if you can do that and get in front of those influencers, that's, that's a great way to to really elevate your own platform and your own uh, personal brand as a writer. Um, yeah, that's a very good point. And that's, you know, <laughs> you never want to just mass bomb editors with the same uh, cover letter. Uh, and, and that's kind of the same idea is, is just getting, getting the uh, message down. Um, so uh, let's see. Well, one of the ways that, yeah. just to, to, to try and speak to Mindy's uh, point, um, one of the things that we did is we have all of our Wakona Live um, are archived on Facebook, and they're all relatively short. So if you do go someplace, if you're, if you're living someplace without uh, decent broadband, and you you head to a McDonald's with Wi-Fi, you're sitting there for like 12 minutes to to watch a Wakona Live. And uh, we had to credit you, Dan, with that. We came to you know, we were talking to you originally with the idea. You're like, you should be really short, and like. That was really smart advice. <laughs> yeah, and and no, that's a, a a great point too. On the um, the broadband is like, um, I was actually just randomly watching the founder again, um, the story of the guy who created McDonald's. But a, a lot of places have McDonald's, and they all have their own Wi-Fi. Or if you can find, um, 
you know, different uh, hot spots in your area, like businesses and, and just glom onto it for a minute to download some content or get, get something out there. Um, that's, that's a fantastic workaround for sure. Um, uh, we had a question from Rebecca Jung. Um, is that query you're talking about uh, to the three different audiences? Uh, court, is that what you mean? Uh, we're talking about uh, Amy was the um, like the query yeah. letter. You know, so I'll give you an example, just like for what I did uh, for Shiner, which you know was sort of successful, sort of not, because it was in the middle of a pandemic. But I wrote an essay about switching from memoir to fiction that Literary Hub published. So I was hoping that would sort of like let writers know that I had another book coming out. Um, I also wrote something about what it's like to publish a book during a pandemic and how I'm getting through it for L um, that hasn't come out yet. But that sort of, I thought got sort of maybe like a broader, more mainstream audience. And then um, I wrote an essay also about, you know, mothers, uh, mother stories between mothers and daughters that got picked up by a series that the Decatur Book Festival ran. So what ended up happening is that those were three big pools of people, but they don't have much overlap, if that makes sense. So if you can even think about your project in terms of talking points, you know, for example, somebody wrote a really interesting piece about the history of moonshine, which uh, is a, plays a part in Shiner. Um, and she mentioned my book. And so that reached a whole other audience. So if you can kind of think through uh, different touch points for the story of your story, how your story came to be, and sort of think about how you might best access those audiences. That basically just helps your your reach increase, I think. I would have loved to have heard that nine months ago because I think it's the smartest <laughs> advice I've heard. That was brilliant. <laughs> I have two essays that I'm trying to work on now about the book, and I'm like, shoot, I should have wrote those. You know, I should have had those got good to go. I, I, yeah. I'm, well, you know what? Let me encourage you because I thought, you know, so with, with Cinderland, my first book, what ended up happening is that I was so reactionary. I wasn't prepared. So, you know, Good Housekeeping came to me and said, can you write a quick 700 word about this in, in you know, 48 hours? And I couldn't. It just wasn't enough time. So I thought, oh, for this next book, I'm going to be prepared. I did not see the pandemic coming. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I started six months and I had this, you know, arsenal of essays and some of them didn't get picked up because, you know, understandably, everybody's brains are full of Kristen, other really important things. Her. So, um, you case. know, so please don't. I mean, this is sort of me also looking, you know, 2020 hindsight. And I feel like it's good to have a bunch of different tactics instead of putting all your eggs in one basket because you don't you don't know what's going to work, you know. Right, right. Well, and um, we have a, a good um, opportunity here, um, you know, so we're, we're thinking about this from the writer's point of view. I want to think about it also from the, the bookstore point of view. Um, what, uh, Leah and Adelaide, what do you believe um, or what do you wish writers would do more that would make it easier for, for you to promote uh, their work um, from, from your side of it? What, what uh what would be helpful to you? What do you think? What advice would you give? Um, so, so it kind of depends. I, I think one thing that's worked really well for us for um, an author that's doing um, a book launch, we did um, a really successful pre-order campaign for the over for a couple authors of the past past couple months, where they were a local writer that was uh, launching a book. Um, and it was a concerted effort to uh, for us to do a lot of marketing on their behalf, but also them to kind of uh, you know let people know like, uh, in the the whole um, idea of pre-ordering. Some authors do it, other authors don't. I think being really engaged through social media, and if you can try to come up with some plan with the bookstores, if they you know all bookstores have different levels of staffing and different. Um, you know, different interest in whether they want to do social media outreach, but kind of getting a feel for what they want to do and kind of work together and come up with some plan together to do that works a lot of times. And I think that for, at least for my store, if authors had some type of an elevator pitch for their books, not like the teasers or like the back cover matter, but something that gives a really good summary of what the book is about, who it like who would really be feeling the book but doing it in a very short period of time because i know that 
you know, a book is like someone's child and I know that they want to just gush about it. And I just don't necessarily have enough hours in the day to be able to really absorb all of that. But if it were a quick, like 20 second summary of, okay, this is the book, this is who's going to be interested in it. I think that helps give an idea of just how to promote it. But I think that when you're, when you're doing things online, people have ant-like attention spans. So something that's shorter and really going to grab the attention, I think tends to go over well, with, whereas things like where it's kind of lengthy, kind of like my response right now, you know, you tend to lose people at a particular yeah. point. Absolutely. Um, sorry, I'm taking notes on all this. I know I'm the convener, but this, <laughs> this is great. Yeah, I, I, also, I also <laughs> wanted to add in um, to, the, to the point of actually doing virtual events with authors, something that has been a big opportunity um, with virtual events is it, of course, makes um, travel is no longer an issue. And so um, we've put together some really great events with some authors that um, we would not have had access to otherwise. So, you know, and I also think it's a good opportunity for the writers that you're originally working with. So if an author comes to me and they're like, hey, I want to do a book launch, um, you know, on this date. And we're like, well, who do you know that you want to reach out to? Who, uh, who is a dream person that you would want to reach out to? And a lot of times these people are open to doing these events. And it's also, I think, a good way for the authors that are doing the launch to connect with authors that they may not have otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we've had some really interesting, we, we did a, um, an event with Jessica Lee, who did a book, uh, Two Trees Make a Forest with Catapult. So one, Catapult is one of these amazing presses that hardly ever tours their authors in Pittsburgh. We never ever get to see them. Um, but we hosted one of them, one, one of these readings for Jessica Lee, and uh, she had been kind of tangentially like Twitter friends with um, Ethne Weijun Wang, who did The Collected Schizophrenia, which is a brilliant book. So and, good. Yeah. Uh, with Grey Wolf, again, is another really wonderful um, indie press that almost never tours authors in Pittsburgh. Um, and the event came together. Jessica was in Germany, I believe, and um, Esme Weijun Wang lives in San Francisco. And the event happened. So I think it's a really good opportunity for authors to make those connections with people that they might not have the chance with before now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's, like you said, that's really opening things up. It's a great point. Um, and we actually have a question. This was a little while back. I wanted to uh, save it, though, because it's a slight uh, pivot in topic. But um, Jess Weibel asks, um, and she was from Watershed. She was on our uh, editor's panel a little while ago. Um, she says, I'm curious what you all are seeing with audiobooks right now. A lot of interest. I am a huge audiobook fan, <laughs> Leah. I has it gone up for you in terms of people asking about the audio versions? Absolutely. At first, you know, people thought that people wouldn't be quite as much into audiobooks because a lot of people were using it for their commutes. But since the commute was like bedroom to kitchen, you know, audiobooks weren't working for that anymore. So there was a little bit of a slowdown, but then it's the interest in audiobooks has really exploded, I'd say, since the beginning of April. But it's tremendous response to it. And one thing that I can say about um, some people who are with smaller publishers or independently published, a lot of times they don't have audiobooks. And I know that can be something that's expensive, but having that, it, I think that it's something that's really good. And it, it offers a, a different format for some people because there are some people who've reported that with the, with the COVID and the, the weird circumstances of the pandemic that they just don't feel up for reading anymore. And then it hit them, you know, hey, how about an audiobook? So I think that we've been seeing a, a lot, a great response to audiobooks. So yay audiobooks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I, I really wish that, and I know, like you said, it's expensive for writers to get the audio version of their books made sometimes. Um, but that's the one thing I always ask our Wakona Live uh, writers, do you have this in audio? I think I asked you, Amy Jo, yeah, right? Yeah. And I was so happy that both of your books had audio versions. And that's how I ended up reading, reading um, Shiner twice is because I listened to it once and loved it and wanted to hear it again because it was just so well done. And so I always try to push as much as I can authors from smaller presses 
to get those audiobooks out there because there is a big market for those. And I think that they're, that people are missing out on a piece of the puzzle by not having the audio um, available for people. Yeah, I uh, I went to look for a book recently and it wasn't an ebook and I'm thinking, why is why is this not? <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, and and now with audio books is I think an extension of that. It's becoming more and more um, necessary to have that. Um, and speaking of uh, the smaller presses, um, Rebecca Jung asks um, Adley, uh, if you, could you uh, say the name of that small press you mentioned again? Um, well, I mentioned Catapult, which does, um, they published uh, Two Trees Make a Forest. Um, and then Grey Wolf did the collected schizophrenias. And Grey Wolf has been around for a long time. They're primarily known for their uh, poetry and nonfiction. Um, and Catapult is fairly new. I believe they've only been around for five or six years. And Catapult actually is, when someone mentioned Lit Hub before, Catapult uh, ownership is the same as Lit Hub. So you'll, a lot of times you'll see their authors publishing, like um, Amy Joe mentioned, you know, they'll come out with an essay around pub date for whatever book they have. Nice. And and I love that name for a press too, because I can tell you as an aspiring writer, I'm hoping that they will catapult me. <laughs> would be nice. Um, and uh, we actually, this is an interesting question. Um, uh, Karen asks, uh, she says, when launching a book, what kind of bling do you think about? Like bookmarks, I'm, I'm thinking that means um, sort of uh, peripheral marketing um, collateral, like uh, different you know, items, bookmarks, things like that to help promote the book. Um, as I guess writers and as bookstore owners, um, what, what do you all think? Have you seen anything that's particularly effective um, or, or anything interesting um, or something weird? Um, I, you know, we get stuck. It depends if the author is doing it themselves or if the press is, I, I'm not sure uh, the person that asked where they're, what kind of point they're coming from, but I, uh, you know, some stores really dish out the swag and people go there for it. I think it skews a little different, like uh, our kids, uh, titles are pretty swag heavy. Um, and like a lot of genre, like the mystery thriller titles, we get some really bizarre stuff from the publishers a lot of times. Um, you know, I think a good bookmark or, you know, I, one of the things now we're seeing a lot in pandemic is it kind of goes along with that are book plates. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're seeing a lot of authors that maybe wouldn't even have signed copies otherwise. Um, you know, we... Each week we'll advertise, um, you know, books that are coming out that week and we'll tag the authors and the publisher. And a handful of times the authors have gotten back to us saying, hey, let me send you some book plates and they'll just send them to us. And so that actually probably moves the marker more than anything. Um, but that's been my experience. Uh, what do you think, Leah? Okay, so my experience is a little bit different, and it's probably going to sound a little bit unpopular, so I don't mean to be rude or negative, but I can't think of a single time that any type of swag, whether it be a bookmark, cookies, candies, buttons, erasers, I think it doesn't help. Even tote bags, people are drowning in these tote bags that just end up collecting <laughs> dust. I say take that money put it in towards a marketing plan or a marketing expert, because I think that what people like more is understanding more about what your book is about and not yet another bookmark. But that's just our experience. Hmm. That's very interesting. I know I, I do agree. I have uh, several totes in my closet right now, but um, yeah, no, I wonder if there's a way to combine the two, like um, maybe like a bookmark with a, um, a blurb or something on it or something that illuminates what what the book is about in some way that's that'd be an interesting way uh to go about it yeah i think it's important also to keep in mind what your book is about i mean i was able to do some of that more fun branding stuff with shiner but it would not have been appropriate for my memoir cinderland which was sort of about a more sobering subject matter so i think you know it's it's not like a, a one size fits all approach like oh i need to get a bunch of bookmarks and i have to do that i mean i think it's it's worth taking the time just like leah said to think that if i have you know this pop 
pot of change I'm going to try to put towards something, what is it? What's going to reflect the tone of my book the best and, and what's going to be the most effective? And honestly, I think for me, I did make bookmarks because it was something that, you know, was was fun for me and I enjoyed. But where I got the bang for my buck was uh, contacting like people on Instagram who have huge followers, right? And being like, um, and I did this in conjunction with Riverhead, you know, my publisher, let's send 10 of these bookmarks. Because I mean, have, I had a, a few dandelions we made into book, bookmarks. Who are maybe 10 Instagram, bookstagram people who might like Shiner, who would be able to take a really like kick-ass photo of my book with this bookmark. And then sometimes that had like a wider reach and you don't have to think like, how am I going to get 500 bookmarks to 500 people? Sometimes it's just that a few nice pictures can kind of go a long way and that's all, you know? Well, yeah. And I, and I, I think that speaks to um, a point, you know, well, that you brought up earlier, which is, is, it's sort of the old adage of working smarter, not harder, where you get in front of the right people instead of yeah. trying to get in front of the most people. That can often um, help, especially um, in our area where, you know, again, geography, distance, things like that. If you if you get to the right people, um, that can definitely help. And especially with bookmarks, I think, you know, um, even if you don't move them, at least you have a bunch of bookmarks. I mean, I can always use a bookmark. <laughs> um, um, and we have... Um, about four minutes left, um, so I guess we could uh, kind of wind it down with um, maybe one more question. Um, let's see. Well, actually, I'll, I'll go ahead. Does anyone have any any um, I guess closing thoughts you wanted to uh, to hit on? No. Um, I'll, I'll just say that, like, as far as bookstores are concerned. Um, I would, I guess I can't speak for everyone, but I assume that like during this period of time, you know, we're, we're aware that um, it is harder to get the word out for books. And I think we're trying hard to um, especially, you know, all, all the big books from the big publishers that are coming out this year are still performing just as everyone thought they would, but it's all of the smaller mid list stuff that is, has a greater chance of getting passed by. And I think booksellers are aware of that and wanting to do whatever they can. So if you have a book coming out now, reach out to booksellers um, in your area that you're friends with, that you have connections to, and talk with them. And I'm telling you, we will go out of our way to try to help you all. And, you know, um, I, I think, um, you know, we're, we're doing what we can in this moment. Absolutely. I, I think you have to um, really get creative, you know? And, and don't be afraid to reach out, like you said, to the booksellers and, and the other people in the community. Everyone wants to help everyone because as as the community rises, all boats rise, you know. Um, and to um, Amy, your point, could not agree more. Make sure, even though you're getting creative, make sure it's in line with what your book is. Um, I actually had a, a, a friend, a fellow Pittsburgh writer, Ben Gwynn, uh, wrote a satirical book on, um, and, and it involved a, a pharmaceutical company. So... Uh, he came up with a uh, a, a fake uh, satirical advertisement for the pharmaceutical company about what their uh, sort of what their pills can do for you, which was it was just absurd. Um, and and uh, yeah, so that's about uh, our time for today. Um, I I just want to thank everyone uh, for being here. Um, of course, a major major thanks goes to our panel members for for doing this. Thank you so much for creating such an intriguing conversation. Um, and I also want to sincerely thank everyone who tuned in. Um, we're thrilled to be able to share uh, not only this session with you, but also this conference, because together uh, it's with your help that we can continue to build and strengthen Northern Appalachia um, as a literary community. So um, just thank you all so much. And um, oh, we, we hope to see you over at the open mic, which is immediately following this session. We'll have a 10 minute uh, break. And then at three o'clock, um, we'll be doing an open mic session. So really hope to see everybody there. Thank you all for, for being here and, and for um, making this such a great event and such a great day. Thank you all. And watch Wakona Live Thursday nights at 8 p.m. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.